tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is actress Shireen Mitchell and author, photographer Robert Berger. Actress Shireen Mitchell was born and raised in New York. She's a graduate of Smith College in Massachusetts. Shireen has acted in a number of off-Broadway productions. She's been on local stages when in 1902, 1902 in 2002, <laughs> oh please, I'm so sorry. That's okay. 2002, she won the um, Ovation Award. No, I was nominated. Oh, you were nominated. Fair. I was nominated for an Ovation Award for a small production, but a really wonderful role in a play called Tennessee in the Summer. Okay, well, we got all it's the dates It's a wonder wrong. that I was nominated. It, we were working in a small theater, but really doing a very interesting play. And so that was great, because it was the ovations great. are really important in Los Angeles. They are. It was <laughs> an honor, an incredible honor to be nominated, especially in the company that I was keeping. Is that right? That year, yeah. Well, you've been in several films. I have. And you can be recognized for your recurring roles in Hudson Street, and you're a regular on... I was a regular on Hudson Street. I've recurred on a lot of different shows, starting with Boy Meets World and up till re most recently a show called Gross Point. The, I think that the most prestigious thing is that you're a member of the Actors Studio. Thank you. You know, I, uh, I was just there last night, and I thought if it weren't for this place, I'm not sure I would be as sane, you know, as is, I am. It's is a wonderful the, place. Is the actor studio, you don't have to be in New York? No, I, w I became a member in New York in 1989, uh, but we have a branch in Los Angeles because oh. as, as over time so many New York actors came here to work and the studio actors that were out here began to convene in West Hollywood and it's continued, so we sort of have two branches. If I were in New York, I'd work there and when I'm here, I, I work here. They don't do any interviews from here, though, do they? They have just started. They're really? just starting something similar to the New York situation. But it'll be from the West Coast? It'll be from the West Coast. And I mean literally just started, I, as in a, about two weeks ago, it was sort of put forward that the first interview is going to come up soon. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering, what kind of qualifications do you have to have? To become a member of the Actors Studio? Uh, you know, it's hard to say because I just think every actor is so unique. I, um, the Actors Studio appreciates a particular style of acting, mm -hmm. a more sort of internal process. And I think to be uh, accepted, they would want, it, it, it's very, it's work that is extremely uh, realistic. Do you apply or do they choose you? Apply, you? Do, no, oh, you, you apply, do. you wait sometimes six months, sometimes a year to get an audition. At least I oh, did. I see. I waited I about see. six months to get the audition. And the audition is exactly five minutes from the minute you step on the stage, <laughs> including your props, dealing with them. And it's f a five minute piece of work on which you are judged generally by a fairly impressive group of judges, and uh, you find out whether or not you're accepted or made sort of um, a finalist. And as a finalist, you can work at the studio, but you can't, um, you're, you don't have all the privileges of membership. But there's so many great people. So but many great I people. I know. When you were at Smith, was it a girls' college? It was, still is a women's college. It still I think is. it's one of the last women's colleges around. I, um, it wasn't my intention to go there. It was my parents. They really didn't want me around uh, men. They wanted me to have a very kind of focused, uh, an environment where I would be focused on my studies. On your studies. Did you go to girls' school as well, I high school? I went to a girls' high school. <laughs> I went to a women's college. I graduated and worked for Mademoiselle Magazine, then Vogue Magazine. <laughs> I worked for Elite Models as a scout. I mean, all women's environments. It's, you know... For me, learning to have men as friends and then, you know, they were always just love interests. But then you, you never, know? you weren't really going to be an actress. Was there a drama department? No, I was not going to be an actress <laughs> because I wasn't allowed to study acting when I went to Smith. So was there a drama department? There's a great drama department at Smith, or there was then. Uh -huh. I don't know anymore. But when I went there, I wanted to study 
acting and minor in psychology still uh, my two you know yeah, favorite interests uh -huh. and my dad just took one look at that at the end of my freshman year and said oh no you know no daughter of mine's going to be an actress and I'm not sending you to Smith to learn how to sing and dance. You so know, did you learn, go to journalism school? <laughs> what did no, you do? what I did was I actually shifted majors to pre-med. I, I studied medicine for the oh, next three years. Yeah, uh, my dad's a surgeon. So of course I wanted to just, I guess, make him happy. And, but when I graduated, I said, you know what? I, I don't want to work at a hospital. I don't want to be a doctor. I want to do this, something that I love to do. And my second love to acting was the fashion industry. That was I like so, the art of it. And you were in New York, so it was really great. And I decided I had been reading women's magazines since I was a little girl, 17, Glamour, you know, all of them. And, and especially to be with Condé Nast, which was the top of the line. That's that. exactly right. So I went to Condé Nast and I said, I want to work either at Mademoiselle or Vogue. And I got first one job and then the other. And then I worked for Elite, and then Elite sent me to Paris. It sounds like was, a lie when I, I talk about it. I was just going to ask you about all yeah, the travel. I've had an incredible... <laughs> Past. When I was living in Paris working for Elite, I uh, was traveling all over Europe scouting for models. It's unbelievable, really, uh, the life. But, and then I quit. And then from, from Paris, did you go to, uh, I, to I Cairo? Quit. When did you get to Egypt? I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> just so you know how I got to acting, just so it doesn't sound like a complete flip. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I uh, <laughs> went through kind of a difficult period and sort of became a bit more internal. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do what I've always dreamed of doing. And I left the fashion industry went back to New York and began studying acting and it changed my life. It saved my life. I was very, very unhappy. Did you start, did you start going to acting school? I started taking my first acting class when I was almost 25. I mean, it's so bizarre because we're talking about being a member of the actors. I became a member of the actor's <laughs> studio, actor studio. Three, three years later. I, it was a blessing. I became a member three years after I began to study acting. I, ha I think I I think I had a lot in the way of imagination. I but came you, you had to it. have been a natural, because for you to go through that whole series of yeah. whatever you did and still come back to what you wanted to do. Right. It's a, it, yeah, it was a risk. And at the same time, I remember people saying to me, God, you're so brave to I leave know. this world and I all know. the money and the glamour. And I said, it's not a risk, really, when you finally do what you want to do. It's the only thing same thing to do. You could have been our editor of uh, Vogue, Vogue magazine. You yes. know what? I had that <laughs> hope. You know, there was a moment. Did you? Yeah, especially because I worked directly with Grace Mirabella at that oh, time. I love Grace. She's incredible. Oh, oh I learned so much. Polly Mellon, Grace Mir Vera I Wang. I love them all. I They're know them all. Incredible women. They're fabulous. And uh, you know, oh, Vera was, it, was working. Vera there, Wang was she? the accessories editor. I mean, that's right. I mean, and the stress of working there was just extraordinary. Oh, what a good time you were there. It was. It was a great time. I was working with great people and I learned a lot and you know frankly I take it to my acting in terms of how I dress. The other thing that I think was so exciting because when you were there I was working at Interview. Oh for you're the kidding. Photographers. So many great photographers came up in that time. So many were working at that time. I know. Arthur Penn and Scavulo. I mean you name it. We just, were so lucky. Did it I say Arthur period. Penn? Yes you did. I didn't. I don't mean Arthur you Penn. You didn't mean he's the director. Yes he's the director. <laughs> uh, what's Penn's first name? Well, we'll remember. Pen. I can't. Pen. Yeah, that's it. That's all we need. <laughs> you don't need yeah. it anymore. No, right. Because Helmut was working there. Helmut Newton, Avedon. Yeah. Incredible time. Okay, tell me how you got to Egypt. No, I was born in America. My, when I we were when I was two months old, my brother was two years old. My dad moved us to Cairo. Oh, oh. So I lived there till I was six years old. Did you learn to speak the language? Well, what not do you really. speak? Arabic. I, it, it, British English was what I learned first. You know, meaning I went to English schools. Right. And French. And of course, I learned to speak Arabic because I was there till I was six. But it, I quickly forgot Did it. You? I had no reason really to hold on to it. Yeah. Could you bring it back? Do you think? A very little bit. I mean, it's funny with all the roles being cast now for you I know, know Arab Americans. I, I'm not castable for them because one, I don't look Arab, but I know so much about the culture. But the other thing, talking about casting roles, what kind of roles do you go for? Uh, <laughs> generally, a very um, energetic. Uh, w women with lots of life energy, whether it's uh, being contained, like this particular character that I'm playing in The Comfortable Truth, or whether she's just completely out there, you know, and uh, sort of ballsy or very funny or very alive, but not small, mousy people very often. Do you know what I mean? I don't. But you have this usually kind do of. That. When you talk about that kind of a woman, you look like Faye Dunaway oh, on the you. stage. Oh, you thank carry you. yourself in a way that that was very a very young Faye Dunaway thank came you. to mind. Thank you. It's quite a compliment. 
I, you know, if you look at my tape or my work, theater or film and television, it's a really broad range of women. And I often say that it's the two sides of my upbringing. My mother, mother is a very regal woman, and my father is that in one way, but he came from more sort of earthy roots. It's sort of like the marriage of a Blanche Dubois and Stanley Kowalski. That's is this the two people <laughs> that raised me. Is this your real name, Mitchell? My, no, my real last name is Mishrik. That's my father's name. Oh, Mishrik. Yes. Oh, that's so, a good name, too. It's a good name, but Shireen Mishrik is too much in the mouth. Shireen sound with Mishrik. Yeah. My mom, Shireen, is Sharon and Maureen put together. She but couldn't decide. It's great. Thank Let's you. go to this other this play. role. Yeah. A Comfortable Truth, written by Mark, directed and uh, written by, by Mark, Mark Campbell. Campbell. Wonderful um, playwright, wonderful director, I have to say. The direction is brilliant. I'm glad you like it. He I think moves it is. you and the people on stage are all over. Yeah, well, it's just There's a, such depth. It's a fascinating way to tell a story. It's almost like a dreamscape. It is. Tell play. us a little bit about it. Well, it's about a boy who's been abused by a Catholic priest when he was 10 years old, and 12 years later he decides to sue the Catholic Church. He, it's at the Strasburg Theater. It's at the Strasburg Theater, the Marilyn Monroe Theater at the Strasburg Institute in, in West Hollywood. It's a wonderful theater, actually. I feel fortunate to work in that space. And uh, it's a very powerful play. It's a very uncomfortable play. You know, it's, it's not an easy play in the sense that it's about a t very difficult subject that most of us would rather not know about. But and when you come off the stage at night, how do you feel? Are you wound up? No, I mean, I'll be you honest with end you, up like Paul, this. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm pretty exhausted afterwards. I mean, that last scene, I don't really act it. I sort of experience it. And, and the, you know, the child I'm, is at you and the... Those the, last, my last two scenes, the hypnosis scene when I come out of denial and the final scene, which I don't want to give away for anyone who should come to see it, they, I mean, I'm, I'm really tired <laughs> afterwards. But it's, it's a rewarding play to do. You know, in, in my thank you note to Mark on opening, I said thank you for giving me something important to do. I mean, so often you wonder if you're making a difference as an actor. And I think in this play, we have an opportunity to enlighten and to heal, you know. It's so dramatic. It is very dramatic. And it's very heavy when you're sitting in there. You I know. feel exhausted also Afterwards. having to go through I know. everything I'm sorry. on stage. <laughs> no, but you do. Yeah, I, and I think it's a tribute to the actors that you, f you, know, that you totally feel involved. Alan Blumenthal, right. the psychiatrist, just sucks you in. Yeah, he does. He's so great. He's Doesn't such he a great just presence. sucks you in? I know. <laughs> and he's also, you know, I think that Alan brings some you know, wonderful comedy. To, I think there is some comedy in this. There's some dark comedy. People are sometimes a little afraid to laugh at it. I was just going to say, you're afraid to laugh because right, you Right, because the subject is, you know, so untouchable. Friend. But you feel, you know, we've had a couple of audiences that got the sort of dark humor. And I think that they uh, got that release that they needed intermittently throughout the play to be able to handle the harder moments. And how long do you think you can carry on a role like this? Well, Tennessee in the summer, you know, was six months of four nights a week. And that... Was it from beginning to end was that last scene? I mean, just oh, a oh. roller coaster of feeling. So I would say I, you know, <laughs> just you know, I could just keep doing it over. <laughs> just let it run, 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 yeah. run. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. You know, I don't. It's so funny. I often joke that if I thought about what I was going to go through before going to the theater, I'd just stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> you can't think about the end of the no, evening. I, don't. I start with the top. <laughs> the top. Denial. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm so glad you came to tell us about it thank today. Thank you so much, and thank you for appreciating the show and oh, for coming to see it. You were it fabulous. And for your interest. I like thank to see you. I'll come see it again because Please I think do. It'll you keep were, growing, too. I'm sure. And, and the sets were great. Gorgeous. Juan Carlos Malpelli. Juan Carlos is just incredibly talented, and I thank him for giving us such a fascinating interior to live in. It makes a difference for an actor. I bet it does. Absolutely. I look, sit on. You know, I wait to come on, and I, I'm inspired by all these little <laughs> corners of of what art. he's put up. There. Yeah, it's beautiful. <gasps> Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Robert Berger. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and. We're back with Robert Berger. This is the Joan Quinn Profiles. Photographer, author Robert Berger was born and raised in Los Angeles, just like the rest of his family that he said has been here for the last hundred years. 
<laughs> Robert graduated from UC Santa Cruz, and his father had a shoe store downtown LA, very close to these historical movie palaces. Uh, and even though you were so close to it, he never went inside uh, the theaters until 1996 when he started doing this photo book called The Last Remaining Seats, Motion Picture Palaces of... Tinseltown. Tinseltown. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you intended to do, was to be a photographer when you left um, UC Santa Cruz with a degree in environmental studies? Um, not at all. I couldn't get a job. My parents were just very disappointed I couldn't get a job, so I bought a plane ticket and a camera and started flying around the world. You weren't a photographer? No, I had, didn't own a camera until I was uh, about 23 years old. So how did photography, you mean, were you just going to photograph the world or did you have something else in mind? I had no plan, no master plan. I thought I'd take a half a year or so and just fly around and see the world. I started taking pictures and I thought this would be a great way to make a living. Really? I came home and went to photography school and realized being an editorial or travel photographer was a very difficult way to make a living. And I took classes there and I got involved in some architecture, architectural photography classes. And oh. they couldn't bring the buildings to me so I could still travel. And it, it worked out really well. But the thing with architectural, architectural photography is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Really difficult because you have such wide areas to cover. And right? you have no control. Like in a studio, you have total control. You get on to a building, you have no control. You have to deal with the environment given to you. And a lot of people don't like it because you have to take a lot of camera gear with you and it's a, a major haul. Well, after you did your your photo book, I guess, was that the first thing you did as a photographer? Oh, no. I've been shooting architecture since uh, 1983. Oh, so, and what were you doing? Just doing it for, say, magazines, editorial? Um, architects portfolios, interior design portfolios, magazines. I was oh, doing that type of work, and in 1990, I went to a jazz on film series at the Orpheum, and I'm a big Louis Armstrong fan, and they had a film with Louis in it. So I went there, and I just, it was only maybe 10 blocks from my dad's store, my grandfather's store also, and I used to work at both those places. I went in, it's like, just took my breath away. It really was the first time you said you never, as a child, went into never. those. We were right but in didn't the they have matinees at those theaters? Yeah, but no one ever said anything. I mean, yeah, we lived in the valley, and, you know, my <laughs> grandparents were midtown, and we never went downtown to see movies. I went down to their work in the shoe store. We were working back home again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I was just taken aback. And then once um, I had a business partner at the time, we started shooting just for our portfolio, because these buildings were so different. And you just don't see architecture like that in Los Angeles. So right away, We started shooting, and, and within that first year, seven of the 12 theaters on Broadway's closed. And they started making swap meet arenas out of them. Is that and right? That's what gave me the inspiration. It's like if these aren't recorded, they're going to be gone. So you got in right away. Right. I mean, you got in just as it was starting to close, but, which now they're starting to reopen, right? Right. But I don't think they're showing any films down there. When I started, there was 12 theaters showing film. After the first year, there's only five, and now there's none. But but they they're keeping them. Uh, and restoring them. Some have been restored and renovated. Others, um, the owners will rent to anybody, they'll take the space, and so they turn to churches and they tend to whitewash the interiors. They still do that? Yeah, yeah. It's real oh, sad. Oh dear. Well, talking about churches, the newest book is The Sacred Spaces um, that we have. And was it a religious project? Not at all. I'm not a very spiritual person, but um, being involved in the uh, theater book and, and the history of LA, that got me started. And we did the history of Hollywood, the old theaters on Hollywood Boulevard, and downtown. I started oh. looking at historic buildings in a different way. And the only kind of structures in L.A. that lead you back into the 19th and early 20th century are religious structures. You know, you never think about them as being architecturally important. Mm -hmm. What criteria did you have to, to choose um, the churches? Well, that was difficult because as I started looking around, there must be 2,000 uh, religious buildings in LA. And then I looked at historic ones, and there were still hundreds. I visited over 300. Wow, and, you did? And, and I went to the library and did research, and then I just drove or up and down streets all through the whole city. Where I've lived here my whole life, pretty much, and I've never been like areas of South Central or East LA. You just don't, if you don't have a reason to go there, you don't go. But how did you find some, the churches? Just I just driving? looked at steeples and crosses, domes, <laughs> looking in the sky. I was like, what's that over there? I drive, try the doorknob, nobody's in. I'd call the number on the board and, and get in. And, uh, you know, I looked at over 300, and I had to narrow it down because obviously a book with 300 churches would be thousands of pages and thousands of dollars nobody would buy it. So. How long did it take you to find them? How um, long was this project going on? Uh, about three and a half years, the shooting oh, and was? the driving around, yeah. Ah. Oh. So, I mean, and a lot of these are done by famous architects, the same architects that did City Hall, the Griffith Park Observatory, Arm Schindler did one of the churches. I mean, it was... Oh, I have that Schindler yeah. church. So, I mean, he's a famous modernist architect, and this was his only church design ever built. Well, it, I, I'm, I'm wondering, did you find some kind of um, continuity? I was looking through the architects. I found A.C. Martin, mm -hmm. Allison and Allison, 
And what was the other one? One other one. Um, maybe Pat Patterson had done a few, and Ross Montgomery. Yeah. But but not um, this. I mean, there weren't. I would think that one architect would be, build a church. Then he'd build another one. Then he'd build another one because he knew how to build a church. But all these communities, I mean, the interesting thing about L.A. is it's the melting pot. So every community, every immigrant community had their own style and religion and way to... Uh, to uh, that they wanted to build? Way to pr prayer. So they would hi oh, hire to somebody to pray. They would hire somebody associated with their community. I mean, well, the Russian Orthodox place, the Greek Orthodox places all hired somebody from within, within their community I'll to build a church. Up while we're just talking. Um, because how did you decide whether to put just the exterior in. This is like a typical church, mm -hmm. but when you start, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know who did, who did this, uh, but it looks like a typical church. And when you start looking through your book, you see a lot of buildings that look like this, and yet there's so many fine tunings that go right. on. That was pretty much up to my discretion. The buildings had to be historically or architecturally significant or just plain fun to look at. And then I had it? to go in and say, what place is visually going to make a great photo? Because there's places that had great stories behind them, but they just weren't that interesting to look at. So that was my kind of discerning thing as they go in and... and How did you decide what to put uh, the interiors and the exteriors? The ones that had the best looking, most inspiring interiors that I thought would look the best on film. Oh, I did the I other see. ones I just did the outside of. If they I had a see. great story or great architect, but the inside wasn't that inspiring, I didn't... I just this, did the outside. This is the Breed Street Shoal. Breed Street Shoal in East L.A., which was um, in the 20s a... Uh, and it's all got all this graffiti right. on it. It was a uh, mainly... Um, there was 75,000 mainly Eastern European Jews that live in the neighborhood. It's all Latino now. And it was used up until 87 full time until the Whittier Narrows earthquake and then um, up until the mid 90s. Oh, it was used till then? Yeah, it was used. The back building was used until the mid 90s until they didn't have enough men for a minion to have a service. Then they closed it, but they didn't secure the building. So oh. gangs moved in, it was spray painted, the roof fell in, and it was left pretty much unguarded for about eight or nine years. Oh my. And it was horrible when I was in there. I remember that. Um it came to light when Hillary Clinton came here. Right, with her Save America's Treasures program yes. about four years ago. Which was great because mm -hmm. it brought some kind of recognition to that building. Right. Which I guess was, I guess each one is an architectural treasure just because it's a major building. Right, and, and it's a sense, I mean, the, the interesting thing is also the demographics. It's a sense of community. That's, That's where a different part. It was a community center, but that community has changed. So now what happens to the building? That's what's and interesting, now, a lot of these buildings that I photographed is adapted for use. They were synagogues, they're now churches or they're playhouses. Oh, they've changed, yeah. yes. And playhouses change, yes. Yeah, and there's a church in uh, Little Tokyo, the Japanese Union Church is now the home of the East West Players. And I it's saw interesting that the other yeah. day. I was really impressed. It was beautiful. And does this kind of show you uh, what they turn into? Yeah, these are two different ones. This is the Breed Street Show on the right, which is, um, these are the, the yeah. uh, it was an Orthodox synagogue and that's the women's gallery upstairs which is in total disrepair with a root hole in the roof over it ah. and the other side is uh pews at the second church of christ scientists she shows the difference <laughs> in what they did with the women they stuck them upstairs <laughs> <laughs> well did you write the text no i actually hired an architectural historian because my specialty is photographing and organizing these projects but history is not my specialty so. and then did you collaborate with him or her? Or um, yeah, we drove around a lot and looked at buildings, and I sent him a lot of information, but he's a master researcher, so he was in the library for months and months and months finding incredible articles from vintage articles about these places. Did you add anything to it that you remembered? Um, there's I mean, were there little stories that maybe? No, not really. It's basically just history. There is. I did do an artist statement introduction in the beginning about how I did this project and what it meant to me and how difficult it was to accomplish. Well, traditionally, the church is the center of the city. Right, right. And... We've got so many little cities around mm -hmm. us that several churches must have been the center of right. and, and the city. Right, and typically it was like the center of an immigrant community. I mean, a lot of these churches were the you immigrant You look community. at it more of, as being the center of communities because right. I remember when you said uh, the Breed Street Shul, my grandmother went to a little tiny wooden church down the street. It was a Pentecostal church, mm -hmm. and it was on the same block as right, that. Right. So that was a community where it was Jewish, and then it was a lot of... I think there's a big Catholic church there too, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. then immigrants from Europe. I mean, there's several. There's Greek Orthodox. There's Russian Orthodox. Right. There's uh, Hindu places. It's amazing. And All it, in that area. Right, right. So each one of those was a sense of community for that group of people. Mm -hmm. And even though the community has changed, some of the buildings still maintain their 
their parishioners that come from all over the city now, like Russian Orthodox Church in Silver Lake. Because it's just that one little... Just that one, yeah. yeah. Although the, the surrounding neighborhood has changed. The other thing about um, the church and being the center of the city is it's kind of like a social... Um, what? Uh, it, it tells what happens in our social life who got married, who got buried, mm -hmm. uh, and it also ties to Hollywood. <laughs> right, there's several ties in the book to Hollywood. I mean, movies that were filmed there, people that got married, there was right. a certain church in Las Feliz, uh, Church of St. Mary of the Angels, which um, mainly catered to the motion picture industry. Is and that right? The, the original pastor, their father, Dot, ended up being in 380 different films, <laughs> playing a pastor. Is that how oh, so uh, he actually got to be in there? Yeah, uh, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks were married there, and it was Father Dodd's vocation to administer, which wasn't didn't make the church happy because in those days, the, you know, the motion picture, they were all sinners. They didn't want to uh, have them in their congregation, but he made that his vocation to... Uh, well, at Good Church of Good Shepherd, of course, mm -hmm. Loretta Young would come, mm -hmm. sit, seated next to her mother and Rosalind Russell and right, right. Uh, Ray Bolger. Mm -hmm. I have yeah. interesting anecdotes like, anecdotes like that in the book. Do you? Yeah. I'm going to show just a couple more interiors and let you... This is the uh, Wilshire Boulevard Temple in the Mid Wilshire District and um, it was a great, enormous place with be black Belgian marble columns in there and the murals were done by Hugo Ballin who also did the murals at the uh, Griffith Park Observatory. Is that right? And it was paid for by the Warner Brothers. Yeah, we have a new cathedral in the center of our town by mm -hmm. Raphael Moneo. Mm -hmm. um, contemporary building, great architect. You didn't include that in the book. And everything I did was historic, otherwise the book would just got out of hand. It stopped at 52. It stopped I think at 52. Which... And then would you do another book? Um, I have another book in mind, but I, I'm just, I'm still working it out. But not w of churches? No, I don't think so. I and think then the on. other thing that I thought was so interesting was that the Judson, Judson uh, studios. studios did so many of the uh, windows, the right. glass windows. And I, I didn't typically shoot stained glass because it's kind of an easy thing to do, and I wanted to concentrate on the architecture, things that I can do especially well that other people can't. Stained this glass is the Russian of, church? This is uh, the Holy Virgin Mary Russian Orthodox Church in yeah. Silver Lake. Yeah. It was actually designed by a set designer for MGM. Oh, so there. So yeah. it does. We do have all these ties to Hollywood. Yeah, and they're in the text we did Hollywood, like in, in uh, St. Brendan's and Hancock Park was the last scene of War of the Worlds. I church, love yeah. this book. This book is so beautiful. And thank I you. thank you so much, Robert Berger, for bringing it to us today Thanks and letting and talking about it for Great. us to see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, Los Angeles, 9 zero zero one seven forty fourth floor we'll see you next time on the joan quinn profiles